Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast number 20. Today we're talking about investment in Asia and we'll be looking at the latest research from CB Insights. We're going to look at the investment scene in Asia in 2017, who's investing, what kind of startups are they investing in and which markets are hot right now. Asia Tech Podcast, voice of the Asian tech ecosystem. ecosystem. I really like this stuff that you, that report that you shared the cb insights was really interesting because there's a whole story in that isn't there about what's going on it, it, it is and i kind of wanted to lead into it with just a couple of other things right so right, you know gree who's who's been one of you know the the most sort of professional and kind of active venture capitalists here they're not out running around saying how great they are nor running around saying how bad they are um they've hired some of the best people in the region to work there you know, while it's sponsored by a Japanese game company, they really don't invest in online games. They have no mandate to do that. They have mandates really just to invest in whatever they think is going to make money. But their original fund, they had a $60 million fund, which they deployed and was rel- relatively, it wasn't ridiculously successful, right? Like, mm. But it wasn't, wasn't a big failure either. And it was good enough to allow them to go out and raise, real, again, without much fanfare, another $70 million fund. You know, their first funded 40 investments, which they started in 2011, so they were ahead of the curve as well. Um, and they invested in a couple of really important companies, right? And I think they invested in Pi, which was acquired by Google. Hmm. They also invested in Luxola. They probably made a little bit of money. The, Luxola was sold on probably a down round, but again, this was all stuff that was way ahead of its time. I don't think any of these companies that they invested in were bad necessarily, but if you think about what the tech ecosystem and the venture capital system was like in Southeast Asia back when they started in 2011. I mean, to say nascent was really, really nascent. They've come a long um, way. They really have. And the fact that they were merely participating back then um, and didn't die and waste all their money and lose all of it, I think, is, is, a, is a minor miracle. Anyway, they went out, they raised another $70 million fund. It was slightly oversubscribed. I think they were trying to raise another $60 million. Mm-hmm. Um, but kudos to them. And again, it just proves the fact that, you know, you just really have to kind of stay alive in this business, mm-hmm. right? And the, the, the odds are kind of in your favor if you're making good investments and if you have a decent process. And if you go and look at, you know, what Gree's investment process is, it's really not like seat of the pants. It's um, highly institutionalized, very specific timeline. They run through a bunch of different processes, and I think over time they'll continue to be um, really successful. But but the reason why it's important really is not so much about them. It's more about this CB Insights. Right. Um, I, was, I was going to ask you with this chip. I mean, Guri, obviously a Japanese-based VC fund, sign of the times that they're going into Asia. I mean, there's not a lot of exits in Japan these days, is there? So. No, and actually, sorry, you bring up another really good point, right? So what's the other significant thing about this fund? And that is the way they're using this fund is really um, – it's, it's characteristic of what's going on in the whole system, right? And that is they're increasing the size of the investment that's, that they're going to make. Mm-hmm. They're increasing the stage of the investment that they're going to make. So they're not just going to do kind of seed in Series A. They want to invest a little bit further down the curve. Um, and um, they're increasing the location scope that they're investing into. So the original fund was really just going to be some Japan and some Southeast Asia. This new fund is going to be less focused on Japan, although it's starting to do that as well, um, but more focused on Southeast Asia, and they're adding India as a specific right. mandate for this fund too. So they're increasing the scope, the size of the investment, and they're also increasing the um, what I'll call the place on the investment curve that they're going to invest to. And I, and I think the reason why this is a good lead-in to the CB Insights is because, you know, as you said, while... The TSC is a great place in, in which to kind of do an IPO. The Mother's Index is way too easy a place to do an IPO for a tech startup, to really have it have any kind of even local significance, but also to have global significance, right? In other words, you, you do see some Japanese firms using the Mother's Index um, you know, to kind of stand and take a picture and, and do the kind of NASDAQ ringing the bell. 
But the reality is that that index is it's more of a kind of later stage Series A and maybe Series B liquidity event as opposed to sort of the firm is really profitable, has come to sort of a, the place where it can actually go public in a way that we think of that um, either on the NASDAQ or on the New York Stock Exchange in the United States. So what, what you're seeing is, and, and we'll move into this as we f- kind of finish this conversation later, is that, like you said, the ability for firms to really take advantage of public markets, and by that I don't mean listing on the ASX. We see a lot of kind of backdoor listings there. We, we could talk about that too because there's been some interesting news coming out of Australia over the past week, and I think this kind of gets into the topic of ain't no time for that. Um, but you know, th- it's not the same significance. It doesn't have the same kind of cachet as, as listing um on the NASDAQ, and I think that was part of the point that you were bringing up earlier, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, but let's, but let's, t- let's talk a little bit about what's actually going on kind of in the funding space, right? And this mm-hmm. CB Insights makes it really topical. So CB Insights obviously is a very well-respected, um, you know, sort of data provider and consultant that does research on, you know, a whole bunch of things, right? But one of the things they do is they look at the VC space, and in particular, at least the stuff that we'll talk about is, What's been going on in the Asia venture capital based space? And I kind of wanted to go through this bit by bit. I know mm. that you've mm. taken a look at this too. So, yep. you know, your insights here are obviously really important, particularly because from a stock market perspective, right? And I want to get to sort of the IPO. The TSC and the whole sort of Japanese market is way more liquid than what happens in this region with the most. Liquid markets here being in Singapore and to a certain extent, if you want to include Northern Asia, if you want to include Hong Kong as well. But from an IPO and a global IPO perspective, there's absolutely nothing happening there that makes any sense um, or or of any significance. So let's talk a little bit about um, the funding in the region. You know, there's a lot of what I'll call moaning and groaning about what's going on in Southeast Asia to the extent that, you know, it's harder to fund something from a seed stage basis. There's a Series A gap and things are harder to to fund from the Series A gap. But the overall data, at least as we come into 2017, um, you know, it does actually, frankly, it supports some of that. But on a whole, um, it says that, you know, investments in, Startup companies in Southeast Asia should reach a record both from the number of investments made um, and from the the mere um, dollar number that's going to get invested in them as well. Right. Right. There was a squeeze at the end of the last year, wasn't it? But it seems like things have turned around in 2017. Yeah, there was. I mean, if you look at the fourth quarter, the third and fourth quarter of 2016, you did see what I would consider to be a pretty severe drop-off, actually. But again, if you look at this from a longer perspective, the amount of money in 2012 and 2013 and just the mere number of deals, right, 400 and 600 according to the CB Insights, was dwarfed in 14 and 15. And it, it like almost doubled um, and then went up by 50% again. And frankly, just the likelihood that that's going to happen again in any market for any security um, really at any time is not really sustainable. So the fact that there was a pause in 2016, um, I would say provides discomfort for some people. But I think if you've been involved in markets um, at all over a certain period of time, and I have you know, for the past 25 years, I think when a market pauses, as long as that pause is not sustained, mm. I think it's actually healthy. Because what it does is it takes a certain amount of froth out of the market um, and, you know, as Alan Greenspan was famous for saying, it takes a little bit of the irrational exuberance out as well. Mm. And in my mind, that can't be bad because you have a lot of people kind of piling in. When things double and then go up 50% again, there's so many participants in the market that really shouldn't be there. Um, and all that kind of gets squoze and really down to probably the seed stage stuff and then even to some of the Series A, right? Because that's where your least – your series a has less risk than than your seed stage but the seed stage stuff is smaller so more people can participate in it and it just kind of makes sense that with more people that are really um, not experienced participating in seed stage investments in 2014 and 2015 that just the number of companies that are actually qualified for series a Mm. as we go into 2016 just should be statistically lower because a lot of those 
um, seed stage investments that get made just were not for companies that were going to be viable. And frankly, if we look at the way the Singapore system is set up, and we've talked about this before with the NRF stuff, it skews the investment and the MDA and the IDA and all the sort of programs that exist in Singapore, just the governments in, in the region, frankly, allocating money to invest in startup companies, you're going to get a skew. There's just too much money chasing too few deals. And it just skews the number of companies that actually are available for real venture investment. And once they get to the Series A stage, they'll say that there's a Series A gap. And I've made this case before. I'll make the case that there's more just like a quality gap and a growth gap. In other words, Series A is really to fund growth. Mm. It's not just to fund an experiment. And to the extent that all startups are at a certain level, particularly at the seed stage, are experiments, it shouldn't be a big surprise again that there was that lull sort of across the board in 2016. But I think what this data is telling us, at least in my mind, is that 2017 is turning out to be another record year. Um, and that it's going to be a lot more rationalized market. A lot of the players that were there that kind of didn't belong there are going to get um, frozen out. But let's just continue to go through the stuff that um, that the CB guys are talking about, right? Because I think I think the point that they're making kind of corroborates um, what we saw or what GRI has experienced themselves. So we see kind of on the on a micro perspective what's happening in the macro market across the board if that does that make sense yeah exactly okay well let's have a look at the data then because there's a whole bunch of data about the vc and investment market in asia coming out from cb insights where do you want to start well i mean let's just start at the beginning right so there's a it says that there's there's a sharp drop between what to that late 2016 and 2016 in early stage deals mm. Um, it's very specific what it says from a million dollars in the last two quarters of 2016 to about $500,000 in the first quarter of this year. Um, and what that means, again, according to them, is that there's a slightly shorter runway at the seed stage, which, which frankly isn't a bad thing. And they corroborate this idea that there's a squeeze in the Series A round and a lot of startups are finding themselves, you know, finding it hard actually to fund after their what I'll call the experimental stage. Mm. And that kind of corroborates what, not, not only what I believe is to be the case, but also what Gris Fund is telling you, is that they're moving out of that experimental stage and they're allowing less experienced people, which is kind of the way it should be, right? Mm. So, to kind of come in and fill that and fill that gap on the experimental side. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, I was just wondering, what is it? Is it because there is a sort of overabundance of investment at the experimental stage, you know, the seed and... And there's not there's a disproportional less amount at the A stage, or is it just kind of naturally balancing out as what it should be? You know, is it too yeah, e I mean, is it too easy to start a startup and then not get A round? It is, it is, and in a way that's okay. But if you look at so again, the headline and the data are kind of telling you two separate things, right? If you look at the data that they talk about for the seed and angel stage, Series A stage, Series B. I won't get to C, D, and E because those numbers are de minimis in the context of the rest of this stuff, right? But if you look at, let's go all the way back to quarter one of 2016. They're saying that like 38% of the money was in seed, stage, seed and angel stage investment. And they say that there was a massive drop off in quarter four of 2016 and quarter one of 2017. And yet those numbers are 34 and 35%. Right. So yeah, I think it's just a slight readjustment. And again, if you look at the Series A numbers, right, the, the, the point that I'm going to try to make here is that while the percentages are staying close to the same, just the sheer numbers are getting higher. And what that means is that the number of companies that are, that are appropriate for Series A investment is going to be lower by, you know, just factually. But again, if you go all the way back to quarter one, 2016, and, and even quarter two, you're seeing 25 and 22 percent of the money that gets allocated was for Series A. And come all the way forward to quarter four was still only 22 percent and 21 percent for 2017. So while well, the headline says, um, you know, the thing that, that there are still vital gaps, the actual the main headline is actually true that the actual numbers are roaring back. People are coming back in. And the allocation is actually not so different than it has been historically. They don't go back 
into our breakdown for 2012 and 2013. But to be fair, we know that in 14 and 15, we grew 100% and then 50% again. And mm-hmm. compar- comparing those numbers to today's numbers should be slightly ir- irrelevant. But, but I think it, it is... It is the case that it gets harder, and that 1% or 2% or 3% is significant, right? It's three companies out of 100 that are now complaining that I cannot get myself funded um, for Series A and for later stage investments, and that that matters, right? Mm. It matters. So those companies that are going to be successful going to a later stage of funding, they're going to skew the figures anyway, right? So what was once a seed or angel round is now a Series A or a B or a C, you know, once you consider the whole figures, they're now going yeah. to disproportionately show up at that round r- rather than seed round. So it's an actual sign of success, really, isn't it? If people are progressing along that curve. It is. It's a sign of maturity, actually. If we were having this conversation two or three years ago, right? So back in 2014 or 2015, we'd be having a much different discussion. And, and we'd also say things like there's no later stage investment. And the real part of that conversation, the factual part, would have been, you know, two things. One is, one, not a lot of money had been accumulated yet to do Series A and Series B late stage investments. But the ecosystem itself was so immature that none of the companies were really ready for it. In other words, they weren't experiencing growth yet. And the numbers bear this out, right? These become less opinions and more just discussions of fact. And you can see in kind of the next piece of data, right? that late stage deals are having an explosion now. And the reason why is a lot of these earlier stage companies have been gestating for two or three years. Mm. And now they're appropriate investments for later stage investment funds. Um, and that's actually a really good thing. And, and like I said, just to get back to the GRI thing, GRI has come out and said that they're going to not only invest more money, um, but they're going to start to invest it at later stages as well. Um, and, and I think that that gets corroborated by this data, and that's a, a good thing, not a bad thing. Now, let's go, let's go through a, a little bit more. Right? So some of the other data says that if you look at it, China is massively dominating this space right? with the bulk. And you can see India moving up the curve as well. These are things we know, and they're really just telling us about the maturity of specific ecosystems. right? If you come back to what they're calling deal flow, um, you know, China and India led this with an average of 98 deals and 96, 96 deals, respectively, from all the way back from the first quarter of 2016. And Southeast Asia had about half of that. And, and again, just if you just woke up and looked around at the ecosystems, that would make a certain amount of sense. Besides the fact that China itself has over a billion people, has what, eight to 900 million people on the Internet themselves, most of them mobile and that India is seeing similar numbers. You're just talking about the fact that there should be way more deals there than there are in Southeast Asia. And they started earlier, too, merely because of their size, right? Mm. And, again, getting back to some of the original data and this thesis about GRI, is that you know the funding that we saw in India that, that came, it also came on the back of one or two really gigantic deals. Right, so Flipkart in in... In India, did a $1.4 billion deal. Um, and you're also going to see, and, and what's the other thing? The ride-hailing app called Ola did it. And then Alibaba has invested in the, the Paytm's you know, commerce business, not to mention, and we haven't spent any time yet talking about SoftBank and their billion-dollar fund and how that's going to skew things to sort of later-stage investment. And with... You know, they've kind of made a commitment softly to invest about half of that money in the United States. But again, that makes sense. And the rest of that money is going to get deployed out here. But they're not going to be making seed stage investments either, right? A lot of that money is going to move out of the curve because for two reasons, really. One, for them to have any impact on their own fund, they cannot be investing a million dollars at a time or $500,000 at a time. It's, not, it's going to be meaningless. What they want to do is they want to literally like pick a winner that's been essentially de-risked and say, here's your growth capital for the next two years. Now just go out and dominate that space, right? So when they do that with Paytm or when they do that with um, Flipkart, when they do that with Didi in China, and then the investments in Didi in China, right, hmm. this fall into the same category as the Flipkart deal in India. It skews the numbers to those countries, but also skews the numbers to much later stage investments as well. Yeah. Hmm. 
So you get a lot of uh, pressure or a little bit of a hype on finding the next unicorn in these markets like Greater China or India. And that reflects in the valuations now. I mean, how does that sort of pan out there? Well, just so again, it creates a gap, right? So what it does is it moves a lot of the money up the curve um, from experimental and what I'll call more risky investments into de-risked investments. Mm -hmm. And it also creates an opportunity because the bigger funds, you know, the funds like Jungle Ventures um, get start moving up the curve, like Greece starts moving up the curve, DNA start moving up the curve. And your smaller investors like KK Funds just kind of end up with the lower end of the curve and the risk part of the curve kind of all to themselves. But now what happens is their particular investments also become way more um, risky because as money goes into, in this region, as money goes into what's now called grab, it's a hard company to say because it's just like a regular word. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? It's like calling the company dog. I don't know. It just seems weird to me. But grab taxi, it's easier to say and easier kind of to define what they do. But money is going to flow into Grab and into Gojek, right? Gojek is actually a really interesting company too that has been very well funded. And it's kind of one of the first times in the region where there are two companies in a space that have been ridiculously well funded. It's kind of like Lyft and Uber in the United States, but even more so because Gojek is just as successful and actually in more businesses and frankly has more monthly users than Grab does. Grab has just been slightly better and maybe because its name is easily or more easily pronounced in English, mm. but it's true though, right? Then, then, then Gojek, and probably because the founders of Grab are slightly more international. Not to mention they come out of a billionaire family. Um, but the point is that the the investment is moving into companies like that in Southeast Asia the same way it moves into Didi um, in China and also into Flipkart in India. You've seen the same thing here as Grab becomes sort of the go-to company in this region along with Gojek for logistics and for delivery, a lot of the investment is going to continue to go in there as, as people make bets on which one of them is going to be the most successful. But the likelihood is that both of those companies are going to still be around in three to five years. And if you would ask me, frankly, if Grab Taxi was going to be around even two or three years ago, I probably would have said no because it seemed more, um, you know, remember back then they were competing with uh, a rocket internet company called easy taxi mm. so kudos to the people that made the the wager on this as the company that was going to succeed people forget but like two or three years ago when rocket came into a market people got scared because they were really like the elephant in the room and yet they do very little right now in southeast asia which is frankly shocking based on the way they entered but but just getting back to the investment stuff this this is indicative of what's happening Right, and I, and I think it's going to be indicative of what's happening too. But this just leads to the conversation of there's much more maturity in the market. And as all these companies that were sort of the innovators at the beginning move up the curve, it creates room at the bottom of the curve for people to and companies, you know, both professional and unprofessional or non-professionals to kind of fill that gap at the lower end. And I, I don't think that's bad, actually. I don't think anything that's being stated in here is is a is a bad thing. And I think. Every one of the charts that are kind of shown in the CB Insights says there was a pause in 2016, and I think that pause is going to stop and reaccelerate back in, in 2017. Mm. So just yeah. a, a quick summary so far, the, where we are in 2017 is we're seeing a resurgence in investment in the region. We had a pause yep. in 2016. There's a slight shift away from – the just in terms of proportion away from early stage investment to later stage investment that's reflected in the type of companies coming into the scene especially these more mature investors coming in institutional investors coming in now that they have sort of case studies to work with so Absolutely. when you when you look at the the region michael now in 2017 are, are you much more bullish are you more confident do you think it's healthier now than it's ever been i think it's more mature so we, as a group of people that have been watching this for the past three or four years, have always been quite bullish. We, the, the sort of structural and sec secular changes that are taking place in Southeast Asia have led us to, and, and sort of the lack of understanding of what's going on here, along with the lack of participation from sort of outso outside investors, always led us to believe that the faster you can get fully invested, um, the more money you're going to be able to make here. And I, I think that 
the the thoughts that we've had while the companies and the and maybe the investors are different than the ones we might have guessed would have been successful three years ago. The overall idea is actually just playing out pretty much exactly as we expected it would. And let's just go do some more because you you know you were going through some summaries and stuff. Let's just go do do some more summarizing of what's been taking place actually, mm. and some of the findings that are in this report because I think as we continue to drill down, um, they're really important. According to the CB Insights report, one hundred and six billion dollar has been invested in over five thousand deals since two thousand and twelve, and if you look at it. More than 60% has happened really since the middle of 2015. So in any in any way you look at this, stuff is accelerating here. Um, unicorn creation is dropping from what happened in 2015. So it says on an annual basis, the creation of private companies with a valuation of a billion dollars or more declined 26%. And again, you're seeing a lot of that at the top of the market. Right, so they're just adding aggregate values together, and what happened was, and this happens in every market, this irrational exuberance means that a company that should be worth five to six hundred million dollars goes up to like three billion, and kind of as those exuberant investors drop out, the valuations of those drop down to a place that's more reasonable, and that's good for everybody involved because it means that those companies actually become more investable. And while they're saying that we don't haven't seen a major pickup. In 2017, we're only in May, right? For companies that are over a billion dollars in value, I think as this year and next year and as we go into 2019 as well, we're going to see those numbers continue to accelerate, but in a way that's probably more reasonable and less frothy, and I think that's always good for the market. Let's look at a couple of more details, right? Who are the biggest unicorn hunters? So who have been the most successful investors in the region? Sequoia Capital out of China which really is, while they do have an office in Singapore, all of their main investments are made out of China and out of India. Um, and Tencent, which is just a massive Japan I mean, not Japanese, Chinese holding company, an investment company, they're going to be your most successful. Each one of them has um, 10 companies in their portfolio that are worth over a billion dollars. And here's where I think it starts getting even more interesting. 62 companies in Asia make up about $283 billion of value, right? Mm -hmm. And these are all companies that fall into the unicorn perspective. That's about $4.5 billion on average per company, okay? Per company. Mm -hmm. And what they're saying, but, but again, drilling down, right? Seven of those companies in Asia, six of them are in China, including some of the biggest companies that we've heard of. So Didi, Xiaomi, China Internet, Lu.com, ByteDance, and uh, DJI Innovation. So let's do this. If you take those seven companies out, and those are all decacorns, right? So each one of those is worth about $10 billion. So let's do this. 283 minus 70, right? Leaves about $213 billion left over. Actually, I'm doing that wrong. It's about, yeah, it's about $70 billion taken out, yeah, of 283, yeah, which gets us down to 213. Then you take seven companies out of those 62, which leaves you with 55. Again, now you see the average value drop almost three quarters of a billion dollars for the remaining company. And in a way, it's not a bad thing. That stuff kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Um, a little bit more drilling into the data. Who's your most active investor? Well, the one that tells you that they're the most active at all times and in all places. 500 Startups has been the most active investor in Southeast Asia and in Asian investing. Um, and it's really accelerated since the first quarter of 2016 when they started announcing all of their micro funds here, whether that's in Malaysia, in Thailand, in India. Um, and they actually used one, and they started one in Japan as well, but it's probably not part of this survey. Um, and Matrix Partners and East Ventures, probably companies that most people have not heard, heard of, with East Ventures doing most of their investing, frankly, in Japan and in Indonesia. So picking the biggest markets and putting their money there. But they have been the most active, but clearly they have not been the most successful and they've not been the most involved in these decacorns in Asia. Although in 500 Startups Defense, they were an early investor in small size in grab tax, and that's going to help their returns in this region. Um, and they were believers back when there weren't many believers. And good for them, Kylie, who runs the fund, is based in Malaysia. And Grab is a Malaysian-based company, so good for them for spotting someone that's going to be like a real winner there. Uh, you just can't argue with that level of success. Mm -hmm. So not only have they picked one of the biggest companies, but according to CB Insights, 
they've been one of the most active um, as well. And, you know, I don't want to spend so much time talking about China, but, you know, China's had some pretty big exits as well. You know, Alibaba, obviously, over the past few years, listed Baidu, JD.com, and Tencent. And then Ant Financial has been huge, just huge. And Ant itself is generating so much revenue and also is backed by Tencent. They're starting to invest in fintech companies across the region. I don't think that's going to stop, and I think that's going to be really significant going forward. But again, it's just part of the maturity. It's the same way that in the United States, companies like Amazon and eBay, as they mature, you know, people will say that they're not profitable, but they're throwing off a lot of cash um, on an ongoing basis, and they use a lot of that money to invest in companies that will help them um, and help some of their sort of ancillary businesses, right? with eBay investing in a company like GSI Commerce and buying PayPal, things like that, to kind of round out their own internal portfolio and make them much stronger, stronger companies going forward. You're seeing the same type of thing happen out here. Again, very important. Um, when you look at those, classes, sorry, like just jumping in, when you look at those maturing models and the companies that kind of lead those models in their different regions, mm -hmm. uh, look at the ASEAN region, so all of Southeast Asia, do you see that maturing in the direction of another market. So is, is everybody in Southeast Asia trying to be like Singapore because that's where the unicorns are? Or are they trying to be like, is it going to become like China or like India? You know, are we sort of India seven or eight years ago? What do you see? Or is it completely unique path? I think it has to be, I think it has to be really unique in, in a, to a certain extent, right? I mean, and I don't think anybody here is trying to be like any other market. If anything, they're trying to be more like Silicon Valley than they're trying to be like Singapore than they're trying to be like China. But one of the issues is that the most well-financed companies in Asia are coming out of China, right? So there's a, there's a dwarfing, I think that was the word you used, a massive dwarfing from a resource standpoint of the companies that are in China vis-a-vis -vis the companies that are in Southeast Asia. And surely in relation to the companies that are getting built in um, in Singapore. You know, I have a little bit of a bias against using Singapore as a model for the region of Southeast Asia. One, because I don't live there, right? So it's kind of talking my own position. But two, because it's such a small market, just um, not only geographically, but in population-wise as well. You have five and a half to six million people live there. Um, you may be able to build a big financial services company there, but you're not going to build a big any other kind of company there. And if you look at the companies that have been built there over time, right, there's a reason why Grab didn't start there. There's a reason why Lazada didn't start there. There's a reason why, you know, Moxie and Arami didn't start there. Just the population there and the, the potential to do any of sort of the big verticals, e-commerce, medical, all those things just doesn't exist there. The easiest thing to get to happen there is to build a financial services company. So you'll probably see that happen there faster. Any of these sort of modern um, sort of electronic advisors getting built there. But anything, any other verticals are really going to get built outside of Singapore, whether it's in the car company, even in insurance, which I guess is finance in a way, is getting built outside because the mere number of people that can buy insurance can't get built there. Um, you're also seeing a lot of impact because people do respect what's happening in Silicon Valley. But then again, a lot of the companies that get built here have to get built slightly differently. We talk about this um, in other topics, but you know, when Amazon wants to go, there's no difference for Amazon to build a business at least you know over the past 10 years in Boston than it is for them to build that business in Houston. It's no difference at all. Right, because all the logistics companies are the same, the banks are the same, and people's propensity to shop online are the same. But in Southeast Asia, you know, Jakarta is just really different than Hanoi, and your major population centers are not um, homogeneous; they're super heterogeneous. So, building a business like Amazon in Southeast Asia is very, very different. And I think, from a data perspective, where right, you see all these companies trying to do Last, I, w I really want to talk about this in this context of getting funded because I think it matters and people were talking about this over the last week or so as well. But like, they want to, want, they want to know why companies in the delivery space, sort of in the, you know, in the um, online I'll shop for you kind of space are getting funded. And while they don't, while it doesn't necessarily fit into these findings per se, I think it's worth talking about. And one of the reasons why is because what would you pay 
And I think a lot of the people that are going out to fund companies are trying to figure are starting to figure this out in Southeast Asia as well, right? So why is Delivery Hero in Europe getting funded to such a large extent? Well, let's just go back. You and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm. Um, and the one thing that I missed was we talked about data, but it's like what would you pay to know someone's home address, someone's phone number, somebody's email address, all of their payment details, and what they buy? in multiple verticals, what would you pay to know that, right? So now that every company that gets into that space and get that gets funded within the context of the discussion we're already having here at any point on the risk curve um, is not going to succeed. But boy, the top three that do have that data, and that's why a company like Delivery Hero goes out and funds other small companies in that in that space, right? And that's, again, a reason why a, reason why a company like Kinja might get funded or some of the other companies in Southeast Asia might get funded is that once they know what you're doing, their ability to not just use that data for themselves, but to be able to sell that data to other people is huge because what would you pay to know that? Anyway, a little bit of an aside, but I think that companies like that where the data on that kind of stuff is maybe more readily available in the United States and Southeast Asia, since we're trying to catch up and in Asia in general, we're trying to catch up to the rest of the world. When it comes to the building out of these sort of electronic businesses, having access to that data, I think, is going to be something that's ridiculously um, important mm. for companies in this region. And it's going to drive some of that de- de-risking of, um, of the investment theses for some of, these, uh, for some of these bigger companies. And that's why you're going to see some really gigantic rounds that maybe don't seem to make sense from an individual business perspective, but go back and look at the details of them and see if some of those have really specific types of data accumulation and then ask yourself, what would I pay for that data? Even if that particular business itself is not going to be profit generating. And I think some of these things you may go back and look at and say, that does make sense. And I think that's part of the reason why you're going to see some bigger rounds get funded in Southeast Asia, particularly in the case where people are buying data. Right. So in Southeast Asia, you see future deals where what could appear to be a delivery company on the face of it, not particularly profitable at the front end, is actually creating a lot more value in, in gathering data because that data doesn't ne- readily exist in Southeast Asia. And that will attract a, an investment which appears to be overvalued based on only the sort of the tip of the iceberg of what we can see in that business model, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I feel like over the last month or so, I've learned quite a bit about that. I've done a lot of work on, on some of those models. I mean, look at a company like Snapdeal. What are they, it seems like a really silly business, right? What do they ask you to do? They take a picture of your receipt, send it to me, and I'll give you a 5% discount or a 10% discount. So if, you, you know, if it's a $100 bill, I'll send you $5. Well, what are they doing? They're paying you $5 for a receipt, and that receipt literally includes everything that you bought. So not just how much you've spent, but everything that you've bought and if Snapdeal is associated with a delivery company, they know where it went. But just to register for that, they know your phone number, they know your email address, they know your age, they know your payments and some of your payment history. I mean, just f- f- to own that part of the funnel could be potentially huge if you're the successful company. But even if you're not, mm-hmm. what would you just pay for the data that they have? Right. And I think that's going to determine or has determined some of the smaller rounds in these companies. And... You know, again, we talk about cost of acquisition. What would you pay to acquire a client? And what would you pay to get their lifetime value? And if all of those numbers make sense, then these are going to be some of your savviest investors. And I think that's what you're seeing here in some of these things. And as the mega rounds um, begin to come, right, as we talked about the maturity of the ecosystem, those numbers are going to start to look larger because the amount of data that's being accumulated is going to be larger as well. And I, I think that some of that stuff is going to start to make sense as we as we move on. I think the CB data that we've been talking about, the CB Insights data that we've been talking about, is going to start corroborating that too if it hasn't done so already. Yeah. Fascinating. Would by, just by contrast, in the U.S., you would that kind of company would get less of a, a relative valuation because that kind of data already exists is out there is a ready, readily available for whoever wants to use it is that what kind of we're saying here well i mean you've had these sort of loyalty businesses in the united states and in europe for decades i, I wouldn't say that the data is in the same sort of ease of use stage that it is or that it should be in a business that's been built by a tech company from the get-go 
But, you know, when you went to the supermarket 30 years ago, they had a loyalty card. And all right. that they were asking for was, you know, to get that loyalty card, they asked for your phone number, your your email address, and a whole bunch of other information from you. And it gave them the right to accumulate all this data. And that's why they've been running some of these data-driven businesses. But to the extent of the e economic development in Asia in general, and in Southeast Asia in particular, has not been as good at collecting that data. These electronic companies are coming in, these newfangled companies are coming in and filling that gap. We talked a lot about mm -hmm. filling gaps in the region. And they're looking around going, what's the best way to get data? Well, how about starting this type of company? Mm -hmm. And they go out and they fill that gap by getting that. And there are companies you know, that do this in the um, offline to online space that we'll see. Really, you know, so a whole bunch of SMEs out there, don't, not only are they not online, but none of their data is accumulated at all. And you can go out and have them. This is kind of O to O. I hate nomenclature, like mm -hmm. almost as a, almost as a rule. But this offline to online accumulation of data as well, you're going to see is going to become ridiculously important too. Yeah. And that's just another way to sort of electronify the entire ecosystem out here. And, and that's going to be way different than it is in the United States and in Europe because the sort of e-commerce style businesses have been developing out there for much longer than they have been out here, which means that the amount of data that they have is less. So yeah, I think what you're seeing here is very different than what you're seeing in the United States. And that's why a lot of that data is getting bought out here in this way, as opposed to the way it would have happened um, in the West, for sure. This is something we've talked about a few times before, isn't it? It's about infrastructure yeah. and how important infrastructure investments and startups are in Asia and Southeast Asia, especially. And this is really just part of the data infrastructure of the region, isn't it? And something I know you're big on infrastructure and platforms. This is another step in that direction. It sure is. It sure is. And let's just talk about the natural conclusion of, of a lot of this information, right? What ha you know, what's the other complaint? And it's not really addressed in, in, in this per se. Uh, this is more kind of the VC investments and, and all the stuff that happens at certain stages of the investments. I, I would recommend to anybody that hasn't read this stuff to go out and, and look at this data. Mm -hmm. We've spent some time talking about the high-level stuff, right? Um, and you know, if you run through, if you dig down a little deeper, sorry, look at the most active investors. You know, we talked about the top three, five hundred matrix and East Invest, East Ventures. The rest of the names here, though, the ones that aren't in China, are going to be sort of family names to everybody that's out here, right? Bloom Ventures, IDG, Excel Partners, B Next, which is a Japanese company, SBI Investment as well, Kalari, which is a new company that we talked about, but Cyber Agent, Japanese, but big presence out here, Cherubic. And Golden Gate, which really I would have thought was higher, but sits in the top 20, which, again, good for them. They're not that old. They're really only about a three- or four-year-old company. So to sit in the top 20 of the most active tech investors in the region is really, really good. Um, and those are just regular venture capitalists. If you look at the corporates, I think all the names you're going to be very dominated by Chinese and Japanese companies, which makes sense as well. But I would encourage people to go through this. There's a lot of insight in here. Um, it can't be covered in just an hour long discussion, but I think this stuff has actually ended up being really useful for the way that I, I look at it and think about stuff. Mm -hmm. But the natural progression here is, and one of the other things that people have been, I would say moaning about a little bit is, you know, what do you do for an exit? I invest in a company when it's worth a million dollars. They do their next investment round at a $10 million round. I still haven't made any money. It feels like I have, but I haven't. Um, you know, what's the exit? What's the exit for your earliest stage investors and even for your later stage investors? Besides the fact that these companies are turning into big operating companies, what's my exit? Well, your most successful and your most highly valued company in Southeast Asia started as a game company. It was called Garena. Um, the one thing that this company doesn't do really well is pick names. <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to laugh so hard. Um, you know, Garena, I have no idea. I think maybe it stands for Game Arena. It must right, have been yeah. started by Japanese people because they love they this love stuff. Doing I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. They love doing it, putting two words again. Wait till we talk about the final thing we talk about here with two words that are put together. I, know. I met this French guy. The guy's amazing. And the stuff he's doing, that I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but I just want to say, like, he actually asked me, what do you think about the name of my company? And I was like, dude, really, this name's got to change. The, the company itself is doing really amazing things. And it, 
it's just a little bit outside of the stuff we normally talk about in our next section. Section, but I love this company and I really wanted to talk about it. I feel like I, I owe it to this guy and, and to what he's doing to mention it. Anyway, but Garena probably stands for Game Arena, and as this company <laughs> developed and kind of moved away from its gaming background into a whole bunch of different services, you know, it does. Uh, media for women it does some finance stuff a whole bunch of stuff but whatever it's done and whatever it touches has ended up being really successful they announced a few weeks ago a couple weeks ago now that they were changing their name from one ridiculous name to another even more ridiculous name we talked earlier about grab just being like a regular word and not necessarily a great word this company has changed its name to c c (laughs) i know C, S-E-A, C. Like, it, maybe it means Southeast Asia, maybe it doesn't. Right. Nobody's really sure. But to C, like, how do they expect to it, – it could be anything. It's like, how do you expect it to stand out in a list of anything? And it's almost like, you know, Line we talk about, we joke about sometimes in the region about how Line is really the – sorry, it's a dumb name for a company, right? right. Like, are you online, are you using Line? Am I going to meet you online? It reminds me of this Abbott and Costello, like, who's on first kind of thing. <laughs> You probably don't don't know. I was talking to somebody about it about it yesterday. They, they had no idea what I was talking about either. But still, you know, like, we're, but where the word is like so generic that when you use it, are you online? Yeah, but I don't yeah, see your name. Yeah. Oh, not on that line kind of thing. And I think C is the same thing. Anyway, I know it's a little bit off topic, but it just makes me laugh, and I think it's okay to laugh every now and then. Exactly. Um, but this company is going to IPO. They've announced, so they've registered with the SEC, but again, they've registered with the SEC in the United States. And this is a company that probably does very little business in the U.S. um, in relation to what they do in the rest of the world. Most of their business is in Southeast Asia. And as kind of a Japanese um, company, they do business in Japan as well. But they just looked around the market and they said, even with the desire for the Singaporean exchange, right, the Japanese exchange with mothers and some other stuff that they're doing there, and even in Thailand, they want to have sort of a startup exchange. I know they want to do that. And the bourses in the rest of the region are too small, even in Taiwan, which has an active stock market but not nearly as active. You know, Garena's made a decision that when they exit, um, they want to do an IPO in the United States. Now, they don't say it's NASDAQ, but that's probably where it's going to be, particularly if they've registered um, with the SEC. And I think it's significant for a bunch of reasons. What, But for the most part, these companies register for their IPOs in the United States for two big reasons. One is it gives them way more cachet, right? So people that have never heard of Garina before or now see will now know that the company exists because it'll be a big, splashy kind of celebration of their IPO. But there's just more liquidity there for them as well. Right? They can cross list anywhere in the world once they're listed in the United States. But just being listed there is again proof positive that an exit can happen for a company in Southeast Asia. The shame really is that they can't list in Singapore. Um, and it proves again that Singapore ends up being more like a vanity listing for companies out here as opposed to a real listing. And all this stuff is gonna I think it's gonna continue to go to the United States. Mm. Um, and if you think about what cachet means, right, and this is one of the reasons why they do it, it's you know, de- defined as an indication of approval of superior status. And I think what they basically are saying is, this company is so good, We and I feel bad, right, because I prefer to have this big announcement being on the Singapore exchange or the Hong Kong exchange, because as a region, I think it would be great. But, you know, you go where the money is and you go where the liquidity is. And instead of doing... A mega funding, they're going out and funding about a billion dollars of <clears throat> of public money, and they're going to do that in the United States. And I don't think that they're going to be the last company that's going to do that, right? And even if they could, here's the thing though, right? Even if they could get a higher like <clears throat> valuation in Southeast Asia, right, a higher multiple to sales or to profit or to any one of the metrics that you'd look at for a listed company, I think they're willing willing to forgo that at least initially so that they can say they're listed on the NASDAQ. Mm. And I don't think that's going to stop, right? So this was announced in, uh, you know, Tech in Asia did the first announcement on this locally, but it was globally announced in the FT a week or so ago. And I, I just think this is indicative of the fact that they're now going to be not just like the CB team was talking about, the CB Insights team were talking about, about mega fundings, but real IPOs for real companies that are b- basically born and raised in Southeast Asia. 
this is the perfect example of that. And it's kind of the final part of that discussion of, is the ecosystem here maturing? It is, and the one missing piece now is not the ability to mega fund, but the ability to list in the region. And this is the perfect example of that, but good for them. I mean, this is good news, not bad news as far as I'm concerned, right? Because they actually get to list because the company has just become so successful. Will uh, that the next then step, become a, a self right? sort of self fulfilling prophecy in the sense that the successful ones in the region will go to NASDAQ increasingly because that's what the others have done. So therefore, you know, that will even make it harder to list in the region, you know, in Singapore, because people have asked, well, why are you listing in Singapore? Because all these successful, you know, forebears have gone to NASDAQ and listed there, you know, why are you sticking around here? So that's going to create even more of a polarization between the listings in these regions, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think the, the question is a great question. And I think the answer to that question is yes. It's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that is, that no one's going to want to be the first company that says there's enough liquidity and enough cachet for me to list in Singapore. I want to list on NASDAQ because that's where all the fancy people go. And I think that because of that, you're going to see that continue to happen. I mean, frankly, if I were list, if I were growing a company and it was worth a few billion dollars and I had, was going to go list it, um, I would do it in, in the United States as well. Right. But yes. that's, that's not a bad just, thing, though. No? I mean, you talk no. about the maturity of the region. Well, maybe they just accept that that's not their strength, right? Yeah. I don't think there's – I don't have an issue with it at all, actually. And I think, again, it just points to the, the maturity and also the confidence of the companies out here that they feel like I can go list on the NASDAQ. I mean, that's just going to be – whether you like it or not, it's going to be the place where your premier tech companies list – that's the goal, right? If you talk to people out here, they're not talking about, I want to list on the tech exchange in Jakarta, but they do want to build their company there. Like watch when Grab goes public, right? Or watch when Gojek, a uniquely Indonesian company, goes public. They're not going to list on the Indonesian stock exchange. There's just not enough liquidity there. And what does liquidity mean from an investment standpoint? Well, again, if I want to just buy and sell your shares, right, I need to have enough people awake at the time where your shares are trading, you can say that there's a 24-hour market in stocks, and there is, but the number of people that are physically awake that have the capital to trade is just less outside of U.S., then European, and then Asian hours to be able to trade. And you see massive companies outside of the tech startup sector like HSBC, you know, they're two listed. They're listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, and they're listed on the, the, in London as well, in Europe. And they trade about the same amount of value there. But that's a very unique stock, right? HSBC as a bank, but it's been dual listed forever. Um, but very few companies that are that, that are going to list on the Nasdaq. They made dual list out here just to be nice, really, for the local exchanges. But they're never going to do their IPOs out here because there's just not enough liquidity and, frankly, not enough cachet. They really want to say, "I listed on the Nasdaq." Right. It's got to be one of the goals that you know, you know, when a kid grows up and says. You know, I have a vision to be the next Amazon. Part of that also ends with, I want to stand and like ring the bell in the New York Stock Exchange. Or I want to stand and, and have my picture taken while I'm listing on the NASDAQ. That's just what it is. And I don't think that's ever going to change. Fantastic. Well, yeah, investors are going to expect it as well from the other side, right? You know, that's what we're buying into. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, because they want to have the liquidity that goes into um, owning or trading any one of those stocks, and and I think that's not a bad thing. So I just and I don't think it's going to end. Right, the the pure amount of capital that gets traded in Singapore and Thailand and Indonesia is just not going to change. It's most of it's going to happen outside, and that's okay. Actually. This is a great bunch of data that you've shared with us today, Michael. It's been really interesting going through it, and there's some really yeah. fascinating stories beyond the headlines. Right, digging into it was yeah very revealing. I think so. I think we should put this in the show notes as well to give people yeah. the ability to go and, and grab this report. Um, and they give it away for free, so they ask for your email address to get it. But I think we should give people the link to that so that they can actually see what it is. I think it's really important, actually. Let's do it. Um, yeah, let's do that for sure. And then the last thing, I, you know, I normally have something that I like to call that's a big surprise. It's a slightly sarcastic look at, um, you know, something in the market that I think is a little bit silly, but today I'd just like to spend a few minutes because we spent almost the full hour talking about just sort of the finances and, and stuff that are taking place here in the CB Insights report, which I think is important. But I just wanted to mention this company called Dream Lopments. Um, 
And yeah, you can laugh at the name. Because it's the name. You've got me at the name. It's the name. It really is. It really is. But I think they do two. They they're doing two really important things, right? So the guy who started this company, literally, is he's French, but he became a doctor merely because he wanted to work for Doctors Without Borders, mm. Medicine Sans Français. I mean, Sans was it Frontier, I believe, in French. And I spent a lot of time talking to him, and he just wanted to be able to give medical care. Um, across the board to people that may not have access to it. it. It's one of the most noble things you can do, right? I mean, whether it's housing, so food, shelter, and care for medical is something that this guy's dedicated his whole life to. Um, and he has basically been working in Thailand for years, right? So he's French, but he's been working in Thailand for years. And what he's done is he's kind of devoted his time now to working for border migrants, between Myanmar and Thailand, people that work, right? He's not just talking about um, vagrants. He's talking about migrants. It's a, big, it's a big deal, actually. And essentially what he's doing is he's trying to provide microfinance. He's using the microfinance market to do microinsurance to provide people that actually have money that want to be insured but don't fit into sort of the policies of the existing insurance companies. And he wants to pool all that money together and provide insurance to them. And he's actually gone to them and said, how much money would you pay for it? They will pay. Mm. They're happy to pay for insurance, but he wants to fix – there's a supply problem and a demand problem. He's trying to fix both of those. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it. You can go to the website, dreamlopments.com. He's trying to do that, and he's also trying to do something that he calls the C-free project. So he's trying to, he's trying to reduce and sort of eliminate hepatitis, hepatitis C in the region. I think both of these things are really – um, noble, and I think people should just talk about it. So, to the extent yeah. that people are listening and care about actually helping people that are less fortunate, I just thought rather than doing something sarcastic this week, we could do something helpful. And I really enjoyed meeting this guy. While I don't like the name of the company, I like what they're doing. And I've already made introductions for him, like just trying to increase the amount of people that can use microfinance to do micro insurance. And I think he's already beginning to work with them to do some of this stuff. So I wanted to do something that was actually helpful and useful for people that are less fortunate. And I told him I'd pretty much do anything I could to support this this mm -hmm. effort. He's raising money as well. So anybody that cares about helping people, there's not going to be a gigantic financial return, but you're going to be helping people. He's going to create a different business model over time, right? Again, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about this, but if you look at the way the world works with corporate social responsibility, CSR. A lot of companies, large companies, spend a lot of time talking about, look at the good things we're doing in the community. Right. That's CSR. One of my friends actually likes to talk more about CSO, right? Corporate social opportunity. There really is an opportunity to create different business models, real business models and real ways to make money, creating new markets out of the disadvantaged. If you look at the way the world is, half the world, three and a half billion people kind of even on the margin have like advantages where they can get insurance, have cell phones, live kind of a modern life. But there's another three and a half billion people out there that don't have access to any of this. And if we believe that the global economy as it is, is a place where businesses can thrive, there's another three and a half billion people out there that can create other business models that are next, the next generation of people that can pay for things. And I'm not saying that this guy is so Machiavellian because I don't believe so that he's going out there to do that. But the insurance companies should start looking at not just um, their responsibility but the opportunity that this provides as well. And I call this like startup social opportunity. You see a lot of people doing, you know, what is it called, impact investing. This is real impact investing and you're, all, you're actually creating a market. Now, your runway is a lot longer here. But over time, if you can bring the other three and a half billion people kind of online into the modern economy, I think you're doing a good job. And that's kind of all I want to say about this today. That's awesome. And what I love about these uh, microfinance projects aimed at, I guess, what you'd call the unbanked is that these people can yep. pay. You know, these people can, can pay and they, want they do return their loans as well. I mean, look at the data from Grameen, you know, in Bangladesh. Yep. It's some of the crazy, yep. you know, 97% or 98%. The default rate was like 2% on their loans. I mean, it's just insane, really, compared to your average corporate setup, right? So I think it's time to rethink about that opportunity that you talked about. I agree. I agree. And so this is like you're, you're like doing well by doing good. And I don't think – I cannot get enough of that, actually. You know, look, I, I want to be the investor who 
and I was talking to this guy about this last week. Uh, you know, you want to be a billionaire, right? Not so you can have a fancy car and, and have your own plane, but so you can go out to these migrant workers and say, you'll put in 100 baht, I'll put in 200 baht for every 100 baht you'll put in so you can get insurance. So you, the, your kids don't have to be migrant workers, mm-hmm. but so your kids can go to college and get educated and stop this whole nonsense of like being migrant workers. But I think that that's the, that's the long-term goal. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that because I really like what this guy is doing in the context of what's happening in the rest of the region. Everyone's getting rich, and he's at the sort of bottom end of that funnel, helping the people that are working try to just stay healthy. Dream allotments. We'll put them in the show notes. Please Great shout-out. Good stuff, man. Excellent. Well, it was a good talk today. We talked about the VC industry, startups in Asia, Southeast Asia. Interesting walk around the data from CB Insights. We'll put the details in the show notes. Very interesting. More of the same next week or are we on to new subjects? New stuff. New stuff next week. I mean, there's always, you know, like I said, ain't enough time for that or whatever exactly. they say on the Daily Show. <laughs> ain't enough time to go through all the news. Just when something happens that you want to talk about, something new comes up. But I want to keep it as topical as possible. Um, you want to get back to me, you can get back to me on Twitter at Michael Waits. Um, you know, you can send me an email at michael.waits at uh, gmail.com. Happy to take that. And also, you know, look at our channel on YouTube, go to our webpage, sign up there and get more insights from us as we continue to uh, cover the region better than anybody else does. Thanks, Grant. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.